servant here at Waterbrook because I get a chance to um, feel God's love come through me to other people, my church family. I love serving here at, at church because um, um, it's great to come in and, and um, be with fellowship with other, other Christians and put smiles on people's face. I love serving at Bear Creek because it's my faith family. I like serving at Bear Creek because it helps me do the lights and the media and I get to help with the service and even pay attention to the preacher. I love serving with the kids because Jesus was a servant. I love telling them about Jesus and it also makes me feel like I belong with the next generation. I love serving at Bear Creek Children's Ministry because I love teaching children and it's so rewarding. I love serving with the children for the open and natural relationship they have in living with Christ. I love to serve, serve here at Bear Creek Baptist Church because I love to meet people where they are. I love serving at the Creek because I have the opportunity to inspire and invest in teenagers. I love serving at the Creek because I can make an impact, an internal impact into the lives of, of the youth of our of, of the next generation. I love serving at the Creek because it's what I feel God has called me to do. I love serving here at Bear Creek because the community here is great. I love serving at Bear Creek because I love serving the Lord. A mí me gusta servir a Bear Creek porque a mí me gusta servir a Dios. A mí me gusta servir en Bear Creek porque amo a Dios. We love serving at Bear Creek uh, just to uh, be servants of the Lord. There's no greater feeling. And I uh, love greeting everyone in the, in the morning and seeing their smiling faces. I love serving with my dad because I can see all the amazing smiles of people's faces. Hey, good morning, Bear Creek. It's awesome to see you and your worship has just been uh, amazing. And so, yeah, we're in the middle of just this short series that's called A Serving Life. Uh, when Jesus went to the upper room with his uh, disciples that night, the night before he would go to the cross, he took a, a basin and a towel, he poured water in it, and he washed the disciples' feet. And by that, he gave us, he gave us a way to live. Jesus said, I've given you an example to do as I've done to you. What that means is I've given you, as a follower of me, I've given you a way to live. We are people, as Christ followers, we are people of the basin and the towel. And so this series, uh, uh, A Serving Life, and so I just, I wonder if, I, I wonder if for just a moment, that you, I wonder if you would allow a guy with a little mileage on his life, maybe to speak into your life. Um, you know, if I could sift through all of my life and, and pull out, I don't know, the things I've done or the attitudes I've had, I've had that have actually harmed me the most, I, I think it would sift down to the things I've said, the things I've done that have come out of this attitude, I'm not getting what I deserve. That has probably harmed me, harmed circumstances, harmed people in my life more than any other thing. When that's been, when that's been my attitude in our marriage, guess what? We've struggled. <laughs> Uh, it has never made anything better. It's never improved our marriage for me to focus on I'm not getting what I deserve. When I've, when I've made my worst decisions almost, uh, almost every time, it's been because I was stuck in a mindset that I wasn't getting what I wanted or deserved. When, I, when I've been dissatisfied in my work, Usually, the cloud hanging over it was a set of unhappy attitudes that said, basically, I'm not getting what I think I deserve. But then, 
But then sifting through uh, all of the really meaningful experiences of my life, all the good things I've been through where something really good was the outcome, most of the time I've been like, like surprised by them. And most of the time they've happened when I wasn't thinking at all about myself or what I wanted, what I deserved or anything about me at all. My, um, my marriage has had its best moments when BJ and I are not keeping score. It's had its best moments when, when what was on our mind was, what does she need right now? What does he need in the moment? Looking back, I can tell you that, that um, when I've been most satisfied and best at my work, when there's been something so meaning, it's been when something, when something has been so meaningful for me to do that it had nothing to do with me, where I didn't even figure into the equation. So, so look what the mileage has taught me. What I've learned by experience has already been written into a universal principle that long preceded my life, long preceded your life. In fact, it's written into principle in the New Testament in Philippians 2. It begins in verse 3. Listen, listen to what the Word of God says. The Bible says there do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interest of others. Have this attitude in you that was in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasps held on to, grabbed for, but he emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant. And so this is the word of God, and we say about the word of God that it's supernatural, that it has this supernatural power in it. And so when it speaks, it can change a life if that life is open to it. And so watch this. Watch this big idea flow out of this passage. What is it saying about a serving life? Here's what the most meaningful life is a serving life. And a life becomes a serving life when it, when it learns its own emptiness and how to fill it. So, like, absorb that for a moment. The, the most meaningful life is a serving life, and it becomes a serving life when it learns how, when it learns its own emptiness and how to fill that. I want to show that to you in the moments that we have here. How, how to embrace, how to fully embrace a serving life. And so I want you to watch this progression through this passage. First of all, I want you to see in that very first verse, uh, the emptiness in us, the emptiness in us. And that's found in that first verse, in that first phrase where the apostle Paul writes, do nothing from selfishness or empty uh, empty conceit from selfishness or empty conceit. So look, look, what Paul is telling us there is there are two words that describe us. Every human being, there are these two words that describe us and they describe our emptiness. What are those two words? Number one, our own selfishness. It describes us. You know, almost every major happiness study in the last 20 years will say this, listen closely, they almost, they almost all congruently line up and say this singular thing, that living your life based on how everything, every moment affects you, living your life on whether you're getting what you want in the moment or not, living your life on the basis of whether or not you're doing better than someone beside you is the surest way to misery and unhappiness. And that is what is at the core of our soul, our own selfishness. Because once you start evaluating your life on the basis of whether everything that's happened, happening to you actually pleases you in the moment, you'll discover that that's feeding something. It's feeding a hole in your life that has, 
has no bottom to it. It just makes you hungrier and, and hungrier. More for me never fills you. It only makes you less and less and less filled, less satisfied. I saw a study done, a study, a study done of millionaires by Harvard University 2018. So it's just a few years old. And so in this serious academic study, the millionaires were asked, how much more money would it take to make them happy? And so the number one answer among all millionaires was this, 100 times more, 100 times more. The answer was the same for those who were worth 1 million and those who were worth $100 million. I mean, think of that once, think of just the, 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 the miracle, the un, improbability of getting there, $100 million, and that's, a not, that's not enough to make you happy. It's now going to take $1 billion. The lead researcher reported that the problem for so many of us, he was looking at these millionaires, is that, is that they discovered they're basing their happiness on comparison to others. It is why you can move into the house that's twice as big of the, as the house that you just moved out of, but then within a few weeks, you discover seven more houses that are much larger than yours in your neighborhood, and you don't like your house anymore. I don't know if I really wanted a witness there, but it's okay. It's all right. It's... <laughs> Look, they discovered, they discovered that they lived, they didn't live by the question, do I have enough? They lived by the question, do I just simply have more than those around me? That is a bottomless pit. And it describes the human soul, the selfishness of the human soul. Paul is describing us there, and he's describing the emptiness in our life, and he can do it in two words. The first word is selfishness, but, but, but that's not even the most serious of the two words. The second one, the scary one, is the, empty, the emptiness we have because of the next word. The word is, it's one word in the biblical language, two words in the English, empty conceit. Empty conceit. What does that even mean? So it's a single Greek word, kenodoxia, kenodoxia. Kenosis means to be empty. Uh, dotsa means glory or honor or respect. You put those words together and it means something scary. It means to be glory empty. That may be a weird and strange term for you, but I want you to hold on to it for a second. One of the reasons that we're empty is because we are glory empty. That word means that word means to be thirsty for honor, for respect, for, for reassurance, primarily because we don't feel significant at all. And man, listen, does that ever describe the human soul? We are now talking about something so universal that describes the human soul. The feeling that I don't think I count. I don't think I matter to others. I think I'm a completely unimportant person and I am so hungry for that significance. That is what is at the core of every human soul. And do you know why? The Bible says, the Bible says we were created to actually live forever and we were made to live in God's presence and to have his favor. And the moment that humankind turned from God in the garden, we destroyed that when we turned from him. And so now the Bible says we're dying, we're fading, we're afraid, we don't really matter because of an emptiness in us. What is that? It is a glory emptiness. And so we're desperate. We're desperate to get anyone to say to us, you're significant, you're important, you matter. That's why we're glory empty. And so we go around trying to get it filled in any possible way we can. And so, and so the Bible says the progression to a filled life is the progression to a serving life. And the first, 
the, the, the first is a realization, and that is to, to realize the emptinesses in us, our selfishness and our glory emptiness. But there's a second step, a, a progression. This moves us toward a, a serving life, and that is the emptying that we need. Not, the, not just the emptinesses that are in us, but secondly, the emptying that we need. Listen to this. It's in verse 3 and, and following, but with humility of mind. Then he just begins to describe how to live out your life. Regard one another is more important to you. Don't merely look out for your own personal interest, but for the interest of others. Have this attitude in you that was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he was in the essence, the form of God, ruling over all the universe, he condescended, he descended and became, look, verse 7, he emptied himself. He emptied himself. The emptying that we need is second. And there's so much said in these verses. There's just so much to be learned from every single word in those five verses. But I can only focus on a couple of them. The, the ones that focus us toward a serving life. And so, so look, these verses are essentially calling on you to one singular thing. A serving life has a singular quality. It's found in verse 3. A humility of mind. It means humility thinking. And therefore, humility thinking leads to humility feeling and humility motives and humility acting and humility doing. Think about the qualities of humility for a second. This is at the core of, of a serving life. This has got to be embraced uh, above uh, all else. Think about the qualities of humility for a second. For instance, uh, let me just name a couple. For instance, humility does not play the game of comparison. Humility just can't do that. That's number one. Therefore, look at what comes out of that. Therefore, humility can't feel contempt or scorn for another. But I want to I want to move to two aspects that I think are most important of all in what it means to carry this quality of humility. Uh, and, and and here they are look number 1 humility is not self-willed. If you want to understand what humility is, it really has more to do with what it is not. Uh, and so humility is not uh, self-willed. One of the most destructive qualities of pride is that it needs to have my way to be self-willed. A proud person is not very open to advice. A proud person really holds on to their own opinion no matter what the facts are. A proud person is unteachable. They will have it their way no matter what. They're self-willed. And it's impossible to follow after God in that condition. It's a big statement. It's impossible to follow after God in that condition because God may not call you to fulfill all your own dreams and not have your own way. He may... He may want you to follow him into difficult circumstances. He may ask you to do things that don't lift you up at all. A self-willed person will, actually, will never actually follow after God. That's what makes it so dangerous and insidious. And so therefore, humility is not self-willed. But there's a more surprising aspect to the core of a serving life uh, heart. And that is the more surprising one is that humility is actually not self-conscious. You don't think of humility like that, right? Uh, we, think, we think that the proud person is the arrogant braggart Lots of swagger, but pride, more than anything, is insecurity. It's the insecure need and thirst to have the glory emptiness filled in us. Pride comes more from feeling inferior than it does superior. 
And so if you're constantly, listen to this, if you're constantly beating yourself up, always down on yourself, constantly worried uh, that, that you're going to do something to make others look down on you, guess what your problem is? You're proud. You're just as self-absorbed as the person who thinks they're all that. Humility is the opposite of that. Now we're ready to say what it is. Humility is not this or that or the other. So then what is it? Humility is self-forgetful. It is self-forgetful forgetting. Now, look at the text, verse 4. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the uh, interests of others. So this is for everyone who thinks that what the Bible says about humility is that uh, I've got to neglect myself and deny all my own needs and pretend I don't have any and play a martyr. The Bible is saying the absolute opposite of that. It's not saying I must neglect myself. It's not saying I've got to deny my own needs. It's not pretending that I don't have any or I'm playing the martyr. It's simply choosing to rank someone else's things in front of mine. That's all. I'm just figuring out uh, that I'm at my best in any relationship if I choose to put their things in front of my things. That phrase in verse 4 means this. Look out for the interests of others like you look out for your own. In fact, that word there for interest is important because it's very generic. It has, it just has the generic meaning of things. And so it means in general, look out for others the way you look out for yourself. The needs you see in others around you, just, just rank them first. Just do them Just do for them what you would do for yourself. Now, here's the principle you need. You will never grow in humility by focusing on growing on humility. By by working out your own humility. You will never grow in humility by working out your own humility. That's just another form of self-consciousness. That'll just make you appear to be more humble. You grow in humility by forgetting. By forgetting yourself. And ranking the things of others before your own. You grow humble not by focusing on humility. You grow humble by just simply ranking others and their things and their needs in front of your own, not Xing yours off, not doing away, not denying yours, not pouting over it, just simply rank them, which leads to the third, to the third insight, the third principle. The, this is a progression toward a, a, a serving life. And so it begins with recognizing the emptinesses in you and the causes of those emptinesses, uh, our own selfishness and our own glory emptinesses, uh, uh, emptiness, but also learning how to empty ourselves of what needs to be emptied. But then thirdly, thirdly, then embracing, listen, embracing the identity that fills you up. Here's your secret. This is the secret to a a serving life, to embrace the identity that actually fills you up. That's what's going on in verses 5 through 7. Have this attitude, have this mind in yourself that was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he, look, he emptied himself, taking on the form of That word means essence, taking on the essence, taking on the identity of a bondservant. Have this mindset in yourselves that was also in Christ Jesus. Do you know that when you place your faith in Christ, an identity is supernaturally placed in you? It's it's why we say the new birth is supernatural. It's not your effort of turning over a new leaf. When you embrace Christ, when you put your faith in Christ on the basis of what he's done on the cross and you say, I, you say to God, I come to you and I, 
and I lay myself before you and I ask for Christ to come into my life. Uh, That's not you deciding that I'm going to do better now. That is actually God coming and placing something supernatural in you, implanting something so important in you. It is the life of Christ. And with the life of Christ comes an identity planted in you. And so you don't have to go and figure out your identity. You don't have to go on an exploratory journey and figure out how to achieve it. Placing your faith in Christ places this identity in you. Let me just show that to you. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 16. This is what the Bible says. But we, Christ followers, have the mind of Christ. Romans 13, 14, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. He's telling telling these people to embrace the identity that's already been given you. Galatians 3, 27, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You've taken on the identity that he has provided for you. Colossians 3, 10, put on the new nature, this new identity, and be renewed and become like him. The image and identity of Christ is placed in you. It's there. It's resident inside of you. And, and how, did, how did Jesus describe his identity? I'm not sure that we can like fully describe the identity of Jesus. But when he chose to describe himself, how did he describe his own essence? Mark 10, 45, Jesus said, I did not come to be served, but to serve and give my life away, to give it as a ransom. Verse 7 here confirms that. But Jesus emptied himself, taking on the essence, the form of a servant. One part of who Christ is and who you are as a follower of him is a servant. And it is where you will find all your fullness. I've told you in the past about Christian Smith's groundbreaking study on generosity. Now, he defines generosity as giving yourself away. Of course, it involves money and possessions and time and all kinds of things. But, but in essence, it is, it is a ser- it's a serving life. It's giving yourself away. And so out of that study came a book as well called uh, The Generosity Paradox. And so... He sort of concludes it all this way. Just listen to it. I'm sort of summarizing it all. He just wrote, it's paradoxical. Those who give receive back in turn. Now, this is a social sciences research project, and these are the conclusions of it. Those who give receive back in turn by spending ourselves for others' well-being. We enhance ourselves. In letting go of some of what we own, we ourselves move toward flourishing. This is not only a philosophical or religious teaching, he writes. It's a sociological fact. In failing to care for others, we do not properly care for ourselves. Even even the best science of our age takes a takes a page out of Philippians 2. Uh, You may know there's been an explosion of happiness studies. I mentioned it at the beginning of of the message in the social sciences uh, around happiness. 20 or more years, these studies have been going on. One of the latest indicates this, that pursuing happiness does not lead to it. Pursuing happiness doesn't lead to it. Instead, this study indicated that What we actually need to be happy is another pursuit, and that is to pursue meaning, to pursue purpose, to pursue a sense of mission more than going after happiness. The authors of the study write that happiness without meaning characterizes, now listen to this, happiness without meaning characterizes a relatively shallow, self-absorbed, selfish life in which things go well, Needs and desires are being satisfied. Difficult or taxing entanglements 
don't happen, but while maybe being happy is about, or while being happy is about feeling good, meaning is, der- is derived from contributing to others in a bigger way. In other words, learning to embrace a serving life beats chasing happiness every time. And this is an identity that is already placed in you. It's residing there, waiting to come out. And when it does, it will fill you for what you were made for. You'll find your greatest fulfillment, your greatest fullness when you reorient your identity around this. I do not live to be served, but to serve and give my life away. I'm going to ask us to bow together. And with our heads bowed, I just want to speak into the heart of the person who's never placed their faith in Christ. I want to invite you to do that now. It changes, it reorients everything. The emptiness that you've felt, the hunger that never gets filled, that's an indication of where you are spiritually, and that is that you're without God and without Christ. And I want to invite you to invite him into your life right now. You turn to what Christ has done on the cross and you ask, God, I ask for what he's done on the cross to count for me, the forgiveness of all of my sin. His life implanted into mine. Eternal life, given eternal life by God. God, when I put my faith in him, and as a result, a brand new identity, let me invite you to ask him into your life right now. You can do that by prayer, by just simply praying exactly what I've just talked about. Dear God, thank you for Jesus. Dear God, I pray that you forgive me of all of my sin, and I invite, I embrace Christ as the Lord and leader of my life. Now, I'm not doing this tritely because I'm turning away from all my substitutes. And I turn to Christ to be my whole and only and total answer for my life. As a follower of Jesus, for you, this may be a moment of reset, of reset. Let me tell you, if you live in this world, I can tell you, you are bombarded with more for me. And you need to break that up in your inner life in this moment. Break it up. And the way to do that is I surrender. I empty myself of the stuff I need to be emptied of and I embrace the identity of a serving life. God, I thank you that you're in this moment and God, I thank you that you're speaking into our lives and Father, I just pray, I pray that you will fill us. You will fill us by our commitment of a servant life. And we pray that now in Jesus' name, amen.